Make a motion to approve the agenda. Make a motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Okay, Trustee Paul makes a motion to approve the minutes. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Uh, Carlin, uh, or Trustee um, Barton. Barton, thank you. Um, make a second to the motion. Do I hear, uh, uh, do I have a vote? Uh, All in favor? Aye. 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 Vote closed. Okay, so celebrations and delegations. Discussion items. Uh, first on the list is board member reports. And I guess I'm up. Yes, ma'am. And just really quickly, I did attend the day on the hill, which was put on by I Idaho School Board Association from February 20th to the 21st. Um, attended um, different sessions on sort of hot topic issues, legislative issues, um, a, works, a panel's discussion by Idaho Ed stakeholders, which included the IEA or Idaho Education Association, the, the Idaho Association of Administrator, Administrators, um, State Board of Ed, Governor's Office, State Superintendent, Charter Schools Network. Um, it was very interesting to hear their sort of what they saw as hot topics and pros and cons, also attended a Senate and House Ed Committee and a bipartisan approach to policy making discussion from having both the Republicans and the Democrats, um, um, members from the House and from the Senate, sort of talking about their views about how to move um, policy making forward on a bipartisan level. And then also sort of some of the other topic discussions. I wanted to give appreciation or thank very much the Boundary County School District. There were five people who attended from there and they let me tag along like their stepchild or, um, <laughs> and it was great. They, I was able to kind of join them for um, the t couple of days I was down there and we met with leg the legislators, both, um, I should say all three of them, uh, Senator Herndon, Mark, uh, Representative Souter, and then I did meet with um, Representative Dixon at lunch. Um, Boundary had gone north. And I want to give a, um, just a thank you to them or a congratulations to them. Their levy did pass yesterday. And then Priest Lake Elementary School on Friday, I went to the Missoula Children's Theater um, program there. They've been doing it, and I can't remember for how many years now. 14. Yeah, I think this was the third and it was Aladdin, and not, Friday night was well attended, and I think unfortunately um, some of the key principals and uh, the actors got sick on Friday, after Friday night and didn't weren't able to do Saturday, but it was fun to go there. I always like to join them for that, and um, I did attend the PTO um, 
session for this last month and i think um, principal lucky will talk about that so that's a real quick rundown of um, things doing in the last month or so thank you um, next was facilities and maintenance uh, committee report that's myself and uh, trustee Rangel. i met with um, ken eldor uh, this last week, talking about uh, facility needs for uh, the upcoming levy, and uh, he briefed me on the priorities of what he's working on. Um, he's done an excellent job uh, prioritizing repairs. Um, a good maintenance guy or facilities guy is someone you never see, and uh, um, he does he does an awesome job with that. And I was very impressed with uh, the thoroughness and the way he prioritizes things. Next is uh, comments from the audience uh, on the agenda items. Uh, first up is Sandy Brower. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I just have a couple comments uh, regarding items on the agenda. <clears throat> the first one I wanted to address is the position for the new board clerk, which I'm super happy that you guys are doing that. Um, my concern is, and I'm hoping you'll address this when you guys approve it, is <clears throat> the funding for that position. I tried to go back and look at the meeting where you guys discussed it, and it wasn't live, so it was hard. I don't, what I've heard is, is SR funds. So if you guys wouldn't mind um, talking a little bit about that when you get to that portion of the meeting, I'm con concerned about how we're legitimately using SR funds for this position. And also want to make sure that this position is uh, funded throughout you know, not just this year, but the following years. So that's a concern of mine that I'd like addressed. And then the other concern I had is over the records clerk. I'm not sure who you're appointing that for, but um, recently there's been some requests for public records and um, return back would be requests for funding, which I totally understand. Definitely want to pay uh, the time for any employee that's having to spend time um, gathering that data, but then again, then a request would come for legal fees. Um, the perception is that, and this may not be true, but it, the perception is that you guys don't want to share public records. So I'm kind of hoping maybe they'll discuss a little bit about public records um, and how we can get our hands on them without breaking the bank. Um, <clears throat> since I still have another minute left or so, I hope you're timing me. Um, levy, super important about this levy today. So I want to let you know that I am out in the community. I speak to lots of your voters. They're very pro levy. Uh, please take care of our schools. Please don't let our students down. I heard earlier tonight, and I'm going to quote somebody, if you don't levy the school, you're going to be levying a prison. If you don't build these schools, you'll be building a prison. We have to take care of our students. So I want to really uh, push that levy. How much time do I have left? Four seconds. Oh, the policy <laughs> committee. Who's on the policy committee? I'd love you guys to let me know that. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Ann Young. Hi. I just wanted to um, tell you that I feel like the levy is so important, and our whole family supports it. And. Um, I know lots of children that have come through this school district and we have doctors and we have nurses and we have um, uh, engineer at Boeing. We have people who come out of our schools because we fund them and support them. That we have business owners and I just really feel like that's the way those children were able to, to do it is because we were able to give them an education they deserved. And by doing that, passing the levy is how we could do that. So I just want you to tell you that I know a lot of people that will support it. Thank you. Next up is Maureen Patterson. Um, so uh, what I was wondering, I forgot that I have a letter from Kathy. Yeah, that's I forgot that I have a, a letter from Kathy Nash to read too. So, yeah, three minutes in both. Um, it's, it's, it's two minutes. Two minutes in yeah. both. Yeah. Okay. So I won't read hers then. 
please join me in a prayer if you'd like. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the blessings you give us. You are the great counselor. Please open our minds and our hearts to your holy word and give us the strength to follow that. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Um, I just wanted to say that um, the mean home household income from the Census Bureau for um, Boundary County is 46,000. For Sandpoint area is 55,800. For Lakeland is 67,000. For Priest River is 44,500. I don't think that we have, um, anybody has answered why we are spending $3,000 more per student than any of those other school districts. So I'd like to know, I'd like that to be figured out. Um, I know that our support units from the uh, State Department of Education, which is the number of certified staff that they're supporting, is 62.2, and that we have 82, or maybe it's more now, staff. And so it seems like since 2009, when we had 1,400 students, that we haven't been cutting back, and maybe should be. Um, I think there needs to be more accountability and transparency. Do I have time to read you? 15 seconds. Her letter? <laughs> OK. Um, there are many areas where the board is not being adequately advised on where money is being spent in the district. The credit card use policy needs to be updated with better controls on who is allowed to use it. <laughs> Thank you. I'll make a motion to, to approve the consent agenda. Trustee Hall makes a motion. Do I hear a second? Uh, Trustee Brown seconds. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Vote opposed? Okay. And I, I added aye. I was just quickly looking to make sure I had no comments. Sorry. <clears throat> I'm good to go. No, sorry. I, oh, sorry, I didn't come back and you were with that was the that was the moment that was um, sorry, okay. moment for reflection. Um, no, I don't have any comments. I didn't find any that I had. I've been focused on the budget, the other budget. Okay. So no questions on the bills, not nothing okay. Oh so don't. Actually, that one there, I just want to recognize, though, in that, in that approval, if we approve the consent agenda, that includes approving our board clerk, business operations administrative assistant, Laura Hall, and Steffi Pavey as stepping down from the board clerk. So that those are included there. Um, and I guess I don't know if we want to identify, I think, um, I guess where is the money coming from for the board clerk business operations administrative assistant would be a question just to put out there so people understand. Okay. Um, uh, Yes. 
Chair, can I ask Stephanie a question? Yes. Stephanie, where in the past has the board clerk's funding come from? So the board clerk funding in the past has been a stipend. Okay. And the stipend has been out of general fund. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. All those in favor of the um, <coughs> consent agenda, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Okay, old business, action items. Um, do I have a motion to uh, go into old business? I don't, I, so I'll make a motion to bring the old business to the table. Okay. Uh, trustee, or trustee Hall brings a motion to bring it to the table. Do I hear a second? Trustee, or Vice Chair Brown seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, first order is uh, policy 4105, uh, part participation in board meeting. Do you want me to stand up? Yes, please. <laughs> Okay, for those who know me, I'm Lenny Myers, the uh, policy committee chairman. So board, so the first one's 4105 on the policy. I emailed you earlier, I think it was on Sunday, about this one, the two different versions we sent, um, you know, and I had modified Ms. Hall's version by taking out the word loud statements because I think it's very hard to describe. So at the end of the day, the question comes down to you, how do you want these, these, these meetings to run and how do you want to put in the policy specifically what we don't want people to say. If you remember my comment from the state, they forgot about one part, but they wanted to focus on threats and intimidation. I think if we, anybody Googles unique board meetings around the country, you'll find some unique board meetings where people are throwing food and stuff like that. Not that we do that here. So it comes down to what do you want to put in the policy? It's, it's very easy. I can strike any words you want. And I did want to call, obviously, as Marina and I talked about, the First Amendment issue on that, which is why we sent you the link on that one in Ohio where, what, where it did deal with a concealed carry that they sued the board that their rights to have freedom of speech were uh, restricted and the board had to pay $107,000. So it comes down to really what you really think you want to do. And if anybody saw the news today, State of Texas took over to Houston School District, and one of the reasons was because the board meetings were getting out of control. So once again, the verbiage is really up to you how you want to put it, and I'm, it's in your hands, really. I mean, we'll edit how you want to edit. And could I add this? At uh, what part? The Sixth, Sixth Circuit says the school board's public comment rules violate the First Amendment, which was in Ohio, where they Correct. put in personally directed, abusive, antagonistic, and they said the government, government cannot prohibit the speech purely because it disparages or offends the court. The court said doing so would be discriminating against speech on the basis of the viewpoint of the speech. Correct. And that's why I had just the three sentences instead of the... The, long, the longer paragraph, which gets back to my email, you know, which the state came back and said they looked at that case and maybe a different case back at the conference. So, you know... So just for clarification, you're looking at 4105D as in dog, whereas we should be looking at... I was looking at 4105F. F, but we still have to... Our first one on the list is 4105, the public participation. Right, I don't think there was really a contentious right. issue on that one. I sent you there two was, versions of 4105 There was F. one. Uh, there was one issue I needed... I wanted to bring forth for the board. Go right ahead, ma'am. Um, it's basically whether... I mean, we have said in the past the policy, and I was trying to look it up for August 2020 when we changed it, we said that public comment from the public on matters scheduled on the agenda will be taken before action items. Public comment from the public on matters not currently on the agenda will be taken before the close of the meeting. And I think Maureen and I disagree on that, but I think it's important that the board stick to the meeting, um, to our meeting to start with, and then if there's comment afterwards, then the public can make that comment at the end. And you're absolutely right. I forgot that part. So back to the board, where do you want the second piece of the unscheduled comments? Do you want them right after the scheduled comments, or do you want to get through your agenda and then stick them on the end? That, that's a valid point. I missed that part. And the reason why I was saying it should be open at the beginning, we limited it to two minutes, but there was a meeting that was two and a half hours long that someone had to wait until the very end of it before they 
could even comment, you know, for they could give their, their two minutes. And I said, why don't you just open it up at the beginning to the two minute person. And then at the end, I thought the purpose of having it at the end was because if something happens in the meeting and somebody wants to comment, I will agree meeting could be pretty long here. It's really up to you guys how you want to do it. And Troy was part, Trustee Reinbold was part of that conversation when we made that change, but we could have a lot of people who are talking on things off the agenda to start with if there's a hot button item. Mm -hmm. And that's why, it, you know, this, these monthly meetings are really a business meeting. And that's why my rationale is to keep the language that we adopted in August 2020 and understanding that it's going to take people time if they're going to, but we need to get through our business. So from someone who's in meetings all the time, I definitely get your point. Um, and I always tell them, my, my staff, anything else off the agenda, we take last. But again, it's what you guys want to do. And, and I we'll just, make the final edit. A question regarding the committee, the policy review committee. I guess I need clarification. Who's on it? Who reviews each of these? policies and how does it come to the changes come to forward is it one person looking at it and then sending it back to you and then sending it on to us is it the full committee that is supposed to the um, community policy review committee looking at it and reviewing those documents how does that work so everybody gets tasked with a certain policy uh, the 18 policies that are on the fall list we took the, the ones that were mandatory to look at first the first eight or so are like optional so we'll get to those second so I task them out, everybody works with reviews, they review with me, I have a Zoom meeting or a telephone call because sometimes Zoom doesn't work too well. We work through the issues and when we think we have the policy right, we send it to Superintendent Branham, we send it to you for an edit, then we come back with those edits and then we send it on back to the board. And how was the initial policy review committee chosen? How was how were the members? Because we got a list, and I'm just curious how that list was. So Ms. Branham sent an email, Superintendent Branham, after I mean I was one of the volunteers when I saw the email, said I was going to be chair of the Marine being assistant. She gave me a list. We didn't want to have a cast of thousands, so we worked through. May I wanted to make sure the demographics were consistent with Priest River. So for the most part, everybody has kids in schools. We have people all over the district. You know, so we hit the, like, like you guys are trustees in different zones, we have that. We have at least one business owner, and then we had a couple of people, obviously, who do not have kids, but there's also people in this district who don't have kids, but yet they pay tax dollars. So the demographics were set that way to be a fair sampling across the board. Okay, but the whole group doesn't look necessarily at the policy changes before it's one person or two people looking at it's it. A, it's at least two, if not three. If there's a debate, then I will send it out for everybody. Because in fact, on, on 4105, all of us had a big debate over over the email and different scenarios came up about how to do things. We had a big conversation about what do we do if someone from Sandpoint comes down? Do they get the same say as say I do? And, and of course, we all know that local people should get a prior as what it says. So we had a big debate on that. So it depends on the issue. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. No problem. Um, and I, I guess it, it is, you know, I put, I'm putting my argument out there for the Board of Trustees to think about, but that is what my, was going back to the actual language and my understanding when we talked about it during the first read is that people wanted to keep the language that we had of, as of August 2020. So, so I think on 415, the decision is pretty easy. It's up to you guys where you want to put that second public speaking. On 4105F, you guys may want to discuss, you know, amongst yourselves because there's precedent out there and obviously there is some risk depending on what you want to do. And my only other comment on that, because I looked at the policy history and I made a comment across the board on this, and you may have seen it or may not have, I would leave, leave the history and the revisions that have been done on these policies so people can follow them and go back to them to see where those changes, and I stand correct. I, I thought we did, because um, I went back and reviewed and I had to add a couple. If I missed one, I'll go back and review it before okay. we make it a PDF. The ones that I have are all. Are they? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at Because one of them has like, Eight revisions. It's uh, 3580, which we'll get to. Immunization has every year it's revised, so we put that in there. Um, so, what is the 
question. So on, 41 of, on 4105, the question is, after the public speaks on the two minutes for their, the agenda items, do you want the public who wants to speak on a non-agenda item to speak right after that and delay the rest of the agenda or finish the agenda and then if there's time or whatever, I mean, if it's after midnight, I'm sure you probably want to stop the meeting and then they talk. That's, that's, on 4105, that's the issue. So the motion on the table right now, um, do I hear a motion? for uh, option one, to leave it as is. Which is this one that you emailed to us. Uh, no, the as is would be the current policy states that public comment from the public on matters scheduled on the agenda will be taken before action items. That's what's our current policy. Right. Okay. And then public comment from the public on matters not currently on the agenda will be taken before the close of the meeting. And that's how our agendas are currently set up. Okay. So that's the... So, do I, hear, do I hear a motion from the floor to leave the policy as is, or do we um, uh, motion to remove the board? Okay. I'll second that. Okay. Trustee uh, Reinhold motion, makes a motion to uh, keep policy as is. Um, Trustee Barton seconds that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay. That policy uh, remains in effect. I'll make those changes. Okay. Moving on to 4105, the issue is very simply, and I'll, I'll be brief, either we put the nice statement says, we need to act like adults, or the bigger paragraph that says you can't shout, you can't scream, and everything else. So the question comes down to, do you want to be a little more descriptive on what we don't want people to say? That's the real issue on 4105F. 4105F is, how do you want to get descriptive? Okay, any discussion? board members? Um, and, and Mr. Meyer, you suggested taking out the shouting part, but I think there's some pieces about intimidation and things like that. Right. I plucked out the word loud statement, the example I sent to everybody at the board. My wife and I, some of my wife, I'm a lot louder than she is. So, you know, normal talking, you could think I'm talking loud. That's my kids. Sometimes they think I'm hollering at them and I'm not. So I didn't want to get into that determination of what loud statements mean in a board meeting. That's why I took it out. And I, and I, I, I like your change, and I would have um, accepted as you proposed okay. from my perspective. So do I hear a motion to accept Lenny's changes? And That was basically the conflict. We deleted the one paragraph that was put in about eight years ago, basically about when dealing with the superintendent and if he has someone in the staff that he's married to or she's married to. That's, that's, that's the only change was that was requested at the last meeting. That's why I deleted I deleted that paragraph. That was the only change that was made. I'll make a motion to accept the second read of policy 5280 as revised. Okay. Trustee Hall. Uh, Makes a motion to uh, accept it. Trustee uh, Rangel seconds it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, the policy carried. Okay, um, that's it on policy. On the second read. Secretary. That's the second well, read. We just have one item before that. Consideration approval of transportation mechanic position. Okay. Okay. Um, um, motion to um, discuss the consideration and approval of transportation mechanic position. I'll bring that motion to the table. I'll make a motion to bring that to the table. Okay. Trustee Hall makes a motion to bring it to the table. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay. Trustee Barton seconds, seconds it. Discussion? Um, is there anything, a presentation from... Mr. Hall, or not? Anything else? Is Mr. Hall here? Uh -huh. He is. He was here. Mr. Hall? <laughs> Do you have any recommendations for or a discussion that you would like to hold about the transportation mechanic hire? Other than it was 
recommended by the state in November, and currently we are we have zero extra buses because we have lots of broke down buses, so we need lots of help. Did we need to discuss a starting salary for that? Um, I believe that I think we talked to HR and the starting salary was like forty seven thousand a year, Stephanie. That would be. I think we discussed that. The, the starting salary would be the starting salary on this current. Yeah, I think that's what it would be. Was. I thought it was forty. It's on the salary schedule. Because we haven't made the amendment. Changing the salary schedule would be a separate. Saying it's funded at 85% mechanic, mechanic position. Okay. I think currently the director is 15% and the mechanic is 85% of what currently it's sitting at right now. And I'm going to tell you, having been a director and, and knowing what mechanics do, that, that having one person in that position is, is way overwhelming. That's yeah. too much. 65 hours a week. For you, the, the, to have known the history of the district, when you guys started back in 1999, you actually had one mechanic. You had a part-time director, and you had a full-time secretary. And over time, all three of those have been thrown on one person's shoulders. Okay. <clears throat> Do I hear a motion? I guess. I'm thinking of just a little bit more clarification before we vote is if I'm hearing correctly this person would be I mean we're approving this for right now it would be for right now at this rate um, pretty much till the end of June I guess and then hopefully with all the levy and all the other things we would be trying to budget in the correct the correct um, the correct team to be part of our transportation department. And I think if, I don't know, this, I would ask Daryl is if that part is already, if he's figured that into, or is that been part of the transportation, transportation um, proposal to us is to deal with this, these different pieces. Okay. Um, so, and 40,200 is, that's the starting rate, is that, 
I guess Virginia, since you've been transportation director for a number of years, is that where we should be start? I guess is that the where where should I guess what I, level? I think you need to give the district some latitude on where they place that person on that scale, because they may bring just a wealth of information with them and skills, and so we need to have the the capacity to move them further on up the steps. That entry level position at one is just nothing. I mean, very minimal. Background. It's an intern position, basically. Okay. Maybe someone right out of school that has general knowledge, but not specific knowledge for the bus. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's a proposed revision added to the levy. Huh? It's a proposed revision added to um, next 2024. Okay. Next year's. Well, it'll be the next year's. This is the current. So I, I guess what I would want to do is, in the motion, try to give latitude to allow for, you know, if somebody, what? If, if in the, in the, how do we make a motion to give you that latitude? Because some, there, okay. there, okay. All right, so there. So do I, have a, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, Trustee Hall makes a motion to approve. Is a, okay. Um, uh, Trustee Reinbold seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay. The motion carries. Okay. Okay. Um, new business consideration and approval of Akadaka State Travel. Oh, that's not me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh I'm sorry. Sorry. I just listened to you and read the chat. Sorry. Wait, I'll, I'll make a motion. Uh, to bring the approval of the Akadeka State Travel to the table. Um, I'll okay. second that. Trustee Hall first, and Trustee uh, Barton second. Well, I'm Ann Barker, and I'm the coach of the Akadeka team, and we leave tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock <laughs> a.m. <laughs> My Akadeka team is here. Stand up, guys. So that you all are understanding what this is, it's an academic, it's like the old, um, yeah, bowls, college bowl, and it's, yeah, high school bowl, thank you. Um, we study 10 subjects, they do a speech, they do interview, and they do um, an essay, as well as science, math, English, literature, help me out guys, social science, social science and, uh, and economics. Last year, this is your small school first place team. <laughs> this team went to nationals. Out of 50 states, we took eight place. And one of our students took fourth in one subject. She's not with our team this year, but it's still an accomplishment. Awesome. I'll stand here until I get the um, approval. So <laughs> we want to go. <laughs> Question or two? Yes, you may. I'm asking the chair if may I ask a question yes, or two. Um, what do you need from us except for approval to travel? I, think I just need your approval. Everything. everything is already, I've already done all of the purchase orders and they've been approved. I've um, arranged, we're riding a charter bus with Sandpoint. We have to be at Sandpoint by six, no later than 6.15. The bus leaves at 6.30. We will be in Marsing. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we will be getting on the bus after our awards banquet and arriving in Sandpoint at 1.30 a.m. Sunday morning. Well, hopefully you'll bring back a report to us. And, yes. And please, and say hello to Marsing. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. I'll Trustee second. Makes a motion. Uh, Trustee, or Vice Chair Brown seconds. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. 
Good luck, guys. Good luck. Thank you. Go Spartans. Yeah. And we will be leaving just because we do have to get up so early. Well, travel say us by. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good luck, you guys. Um, I'm not Next, next on the agenda is a consideration and approval of the May 16th levy ballot resolution. Since we do not have a dollar amount yet, um, I should have caught that. We should have struck that from the agenda. So okay. uh, I won't even bring it to the floor. Okay. I was going to say I haven't seen a resolution. I wasn't. I was wondering. Okay. Uh, next is approval of emergency closures, uh, 222 and 223. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the emergency closures for 222 and 223. I second. Okay, Trustee Hall first, uh, uh, Vice Chair Brown seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, it's approved. Uh, next, I need a motion to consideration and approve of prom um, I'll make a motion to um, approve the prom venue. We would love to hear some details. Okay. Trustee Hall uh, makes a motion to approve. Any seconds? I'd like to... Troy, uh, uh, Chair. Trustee Rangel. Do we know where the venue is? I'm sorry. Well, that's what sure. we're going to find out. Okay. No, so they're not here, so I don't think that they're requesting it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I, I believe they uh, withdrew because of some of uh, my insurance issues. They wanted to include it in uh, Washington. They ran it that was in the middle of the district. So they're going to use the high school gym. Oh, okay. perfect. Oh, okay. okay. So all of ours were in we, the high school gym. <coughs> do we want to bring a motion in? What's that? Do we want to bring a motion in? There's nothing to act on. Yeah. Okay. okay. I didn't know that. And, so. Yeah, they're just going to do that at the high school. But we stopped at Prudhoe, don't we? Trail, trail, ah. <laughs> Contagious. Uh, Chair Rutledge, I want to just bring back, um, just I think for the public, um, for public awareness, we pulled the consideration approval of the May 16th levy ballot resolution, but we are, our intention is to have a, or have a special meeting to approve that resolution. Yes, yes. I think we better clarify that. Yes. <laughs> Next for, for the record, um, the, the board has not come up with a dollar amount yet or, or levy language. Um, it's not that we're not doing anything about it. It's just that we're gotta, we have to have another meeting. Sorry for the confusion. So we, we just didn't have it ready for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make sure people realize that we are working on it and trying to come up with. OK, so uh, prom venue, um, we don't have to worry about. OK, so that's struck from the um, agenda. Next up, uh, do I hear a motion for the four-day um, four-day week calendar? Chair, I'll bring up the motion for the four-day calendar. Okay, uh, Vice Chairman Brown makes a motion to bring the uh, four-day week calendar to the floor. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, Trustee Barton makes a second. Comments? Um, I need some clarification before I vote on this. Um, can you, bring, can you bring out the calendar on the, so we can see it? Yes. She can. And I guess my first question is, who was, who made up, who, who, who's the calendar committee and who, who do they represent? I need to know who was part of that calendar committee, just to see what kind of um, cross group we had involved. Yeah. Um, myself. Teachers across the district, um, this court, uh, Jerry Hughes, we try to get represent from each building, so I'm yeah, going to show you. Sarah, Sarah Butler. Sarah Butler. Butler. Um, Penny Whitaker. Penny Whitaker, thank you. Um, there's one more I'm missing. Donna. Donna Storo. Um, yeah, she represents classified as well. So yeah. That's right. Um, let me say one more. Maybe that was it. So they met both district and district employees across the uh, across the district. So what I need to know, and when I look at this, couple of things. 
I see that the students actually get off in November, from the 17th of November, all the way through to the 27th. So there's 10 days off there. In November? In uh, November. You're, you're reading that wrong there, I'm sorry. Um, it's, the, it's just the Thanksgiving week as normal, but um, the triangle would be uh, parent-teacher conferences during the day. That's what I understand. The kids aren't going to school, correct? For the five days that they would normally have off. But at the same, you did take off um, November. They are going to school on Veterans Day. Um, there's they, not, there's no school no. on Veterans Day it's next Saturday. year. It's a Saturday. Oh, it's or a Saturday. Saturday. Okay, so it's it's on the weekend. Until they get the holiday yeah, so we'd have to observe it on the last day of school that week, the Thursday, I believe. So what is, because I just got these tonight, or they may have been in the email, but I didn't pick them up. What is this, what are we adding to the day for the kids, especially the elementary school kids? Um, the, the one hour was, was approved. I never heard of one hour being approved. When was that approved by the board? It wasn't approved by the board. That's what you're, that's what you're doing right now. We're adding an hour to the day? Yes, ma'am. That was what through the uh, administrative team. Did this go out to the parents? Was this calendar um, recirculated through the parents to understand with the schedule of what it that's, meant for the elementary that's school? That's not our normal protocols and policies. I realize it's not our normal so protocol. Would be no. Then I would make a motion that this needs to be circulated among the parents with the time frame of the start and stop time for the, each of the schools so kid, p parents understand and get some feedback from them. Because I think an hour is an awfully long time to be adding, if, we're, if that's what it is for the elementary school class, I'm very concerned about adding an hour to the day for the kids, especially up north. Ms. Hall, I think that you'd um, be surprised once you once you listen to the elementary principals describe their schedules, it's, it's not as you think. So each of the building principals has been um, asked to present the, the individual school schedules and how it works with the, bus, the buses that run. Okay, then I would want to abstain. I would want to table the vote on this until we hear that discussion okay. by Sounds the, good. The, the principals. Okay, so the motion on... What's that? Wait. Just here. May we speak? Yes. Um, so we scheduled, we ran the schedule, Marty, and it, we would have a start time of 7.50. Mm -hmm. And the kids are there by 7.30 right now anyway, mm -hmm. even at pre slate That's when the buses come in. And then uh, they would be there at 7.50, and they would dismiss at 3.20. But that's an hour later, right? Because they're getting out at, aren't they getting out at 2.30ish? Well, right it's just, yeah, it's, you're at the lake, they're out at 2.20. At Idaho Hill, we actually go until 2.35. Um, at Priest Lake, are they, or 2.25. 2.25 in the area, so it would be, and then we figured out if it were a 45 minute extension, it would just be backed up 15 minutes more, so they would be out at 3.05. Right. I have a calendar that has the minutes, actually, I gave you. I do the minutes on the back. Um, just, just we bring the motion to the table so that we can have, listen to yeah. um, This is what it would yeah. look like okay. at What's that? Um, she wants to bring the motion to the table so, so we, we can, can have this discussion. Oh, yes, please. Um, point of order, we need a motion to bring this to the table. I'll bring this item to the right. table so we can discuss it. Okay. Vice. Vice Chair Brown brings a motion to the table to discuss this. Do I have a second? A second. Okay. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. What? Mr. George just said something I didn't quite hear. I just would like to advise you that the calendar committee, uh, I don't know exactly what's permitted, but if you're asking about the calendar committee part of it, uh, I don't know what was presented, but that may or may not have been part of our discussion. So. so it's two separate. It just took your calendar exactly and I just. Plotted in very times. Gotcha. So we're merging both motions. Yeah. Oh, no, this is the 60 minute calendar with very times. Right. This is what it means. This is what this is what this means in this. Mm -hmm. That's and that's what I was expecting to see when the when we brought back a calendar, when I voted no, I wanted to see more detail of how this looked overall for the different schools. 
and that wasn't, you know, and I, um, so that's, I want to know how it impacts the students, um, and from the pr principal's perspective and for so, parents. So my presentation, but we got moved to the end, was exactly what you want. So I can do my presentation now and tell you about what it looks like at PRE. Um, I think, I think that would be appropriate. Yes, yes. Please. and that's the motion yes, that Vice is. Chair Brown brought to the table. Yes. And I second. Okay, so I hand it to you um, in this. This is just last month's newsletter, so that's just information for you to read, and I will be working on a new one this week, but I've been working on a schedule for you instead of doing a newsletter. So, for this month. So if you look, I have two things. One is the RTI schedule, which is our Title I schedule with our Title I instructional assistant. I increased that time. One of the things that this schedule does is it increases intervention time to 45 minutes instead of 25 minutes. Plus it also includes two 25 minute extra additional intensive intervention for students that wouldn't get it before. Okay, so that is that. Another thing that's big at PRE is everybody goes, well, what's it going to do to lunch? <laughs> and so we normally start at 1030. Guess what? We Every grade level gets its own lunch in the lunchroom, which is going to be much better. And each one gets to be in there by themselves and the same amount of time that they had. It is going to take two hours, but it will, be, it will work within the schedule. Um, another thing is if you look at the RTI time I did combine, um, fifth and sixth grade RT intervention at the end of the day, but I am going to pull our um, specials people and we're going to do some enrichment with that and we're going to maybe put on some plays, we're going, and we're going to be looking at our intervention groups every four weeks so that even kids that maybe wouldn't get to participate in an enrichment um, activity would get to do that every so often. So, um, so looking at this, um, I was able to do a lot, add some things that actually made PRE a little bit better because we have more time so we could have lunches um, and have only one grade level per lunch. And, um, and then it ended up giving um, the poor PE teacher and the specials teachers time to use the restroom between, <laughs> between their groups. Um, and it gives us time to do some enrichment with our fifth and sixth grade students. and. Um, so, but that's what that looks like. I actually looked, oh, another thing that it did is I've gone in and started looking at each grade level. I didn't have that finished I, by the end of today with other things going on and phone calls and student behavior. I have got, had gotten all the way to fourth grade. It also incre increases academic learning time in ELA and mathematics in every grade level. Um, so not only do they go from the 90 minutes that we had before, we're increasing that time for ELA and mathematics. So, okay. So there's some each day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't have a specific schedule because I rely on Matt and Amber, and because I don't know, I'm pretty slight in staffing from the PE teacher, the music teacher from the other school. So I don't have a set then, schedule other than the 7:50 start time, the 3:20 end time. Okay. Okay, and the only thing I would, I mean, at this point, I guess, in terms of this schedule for the principals, I mean, I, I'm still concerned about the learning loss in the summertime. I see this truncated. I see, I, I, I'm seeing that the students are going to be off on that Friday before, all the way through to that Monday, and then off again almost in a month later for another, you know, 10 or almost a week. Well, actually two weeks. Um, I may be conventional and old-fashioned, old but I think that's a lot of time off in that period of time. And I, I get it that the, the calendar team thought this. I do wonder what the parents do think about it and whether they have any comments on it before we approve it. Because I expected to see a couple of two or maybe two calendars in front of us. The only thing I guess I would ask if, if the board is choosing to go ahead with this one as is, is that we put it back after a year or like some other school districts and bring it back to the community to really vent it once more with the community did this four day schedule work. But I, I'm concerned about the learning loss on this and here 
you know somebody who went to you know it's a different time and it's not we know that it's not going to really save us money so we know that it's um, because we're going to try to keep our <coughs> staff um, the, the, the classified and bus drivers whole as much as possible so that's my concern about this schedule. We we're really putting it all into a very short period of time and extending the dates, and I don't know what that's going to do to the younger kids. Well, and I'd like to counter that because I think that um, looking at the calendar, this is very typical. It is very similar to what it's been. It goes a few more days at the end, and most of our kids are already there by at least at Idaho Hill by 7:30, and hopefully our goal is to do um, student um, attendance and even though we're talking about not huge numbers for increased revenue we're still going to go four to six percent which is depending on how much our in budget is that's still quite a bit in the small district and that we may not get that because we can't do anything with facilities and, and transportation we're looking at. We may get some savings in the transportation with gas, but not with the bus drivers. I forgot one thing. I also put in an early release time for kindergarten if parents wanted to pick up, which would also at 1.30. And then that would also give, we normally at PRE have Friday offs for kindergarten anyway. And that way we could have some intervention time from 1.30 to 2.30 for those students. Okay. So, I mean, I think there's some positives to it. I just want us to, I want the board, whomever the board might be, in another year or two, reassess this and see if this has worked or not. Um, not make this a, just a done deal, but do it really a, a clear evaluation and do three different um, surveys out to community, out to the parents, students, and staff separately do a better job than we did when we were first reaching out to people to try to get that piece back. Because I think there's some shortfalls in what we did to reach out to people. But um, I understand where the board is with it, but those are my concerns. I'm voicing my concerns. Um, I guess the time off in November will be great for those who are going hunting, and I recognize that's probably a good time for going. everybody going hunting. Okay. <laughs> Well, November's pretty standard. Any other, any other comments? I agree with um, Trustee um, Barton. Barton. Okay. Okay. Those in favor of the calendar as stated, say aye. 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 Those opposed? I'm going okay. to abstain. Okay. The motion carries. The calendar is adopted. Thank you. Thank you for all the hard work you guys put into that. It wasn't easy. Next is a first first read of policy. Do I have your motion? Okay, I'm back. The first one back is pretty motion. easy. Chair. Um, I'll make a motion chair to hear okay. this policy. Okay. Vice Chair Brown makes a motion to hear policy. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay. Well, Trustee Hall makes a second. Cheers. So the first one is actually uh, 4500, 2510, and 2510P. It's all about gifts and libraries. I, Ms. Hall, uh, Trustee Hall, I reviewed your notes. I, I got to comment on the one policy that was missed. And quite honestly, before I discuss the board, I'm going to take it back. We're going to rework it. I just want to know if there's any other questions you have specifically on the one policy. And we are talking to the librarians already, uh, but I did get your note about if you didn't see a mission statement. So I got to go back and look at that one about mission statement for the librarians. Um, I'm just looking at. Um, Pulling forth the, I've got to pull forth my notes. So you've got, you're looking at 2510, correct? Yeah, 2510 is where you commented about the mission statement. And right. There was a policy, I think it was 2583. It's in my computer, which I just closed. Yeah. Um, and I will go back and look at that one. Uh, actually, me, but. Uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's a hard one because there's a couple of these mixtures of, uh, there's this menagerie of the policies. And I think that um, hey, that was the first one up here where you didn't put where you sit right here. You didn't find a mission for division. And you're right. I'll take a look at that one. And then when you slide on down, there was uh, 2530 is the one. We'll go back and take a look at that one and see how that applies. And that I think if you look at that, we don't have 2530 in West Warner County, but it might. It 
covers a bunch of this stuff in there. And mm -hmm. when I was looking at that, the summaries of the packets, it made sense to, for us to maybe apply it. When Superintendent Anselmo did a whole work on bringing this forward, trying to bring it forward back in May mm -hmm. of 2022, I think he was keeping, you know, that there was that separate or that piece there. So I think it, rather than dealing with the curricular and mixing the library materials with the curriculum materials, maybe keep it separate because it will be easier to, I think, maybe to deal with. Otherwise, you're, mi you're going to have to go back and do the other one and back again. And we've already yeah, done some of the stuff on the that. curricular materials. I'm going to send it back to Dan. He's doing this for me, and we'll, we'll look at it. OK? OK. <laughs> do you want the other one, though? The other one, uh, 3525. That is the simple immunization one. That is reviewed every single year. Um, and, and Ms. Hall, I noted your comment. I'll make sure that the heading doesn't get, get jacked up on the one page. But all it really does is every year, this one is, if you look at the history, it's been reviewed every single year because the dates of the kids, obviously when they were born, you know, changes. So there's a nice, if you slide down to the middle of it, there's a nice chart. This is the main changes. Here we go. Who was there? Oh, wrong ones. Wrong ones. Should be 3525. Slide down. Should be right here. Yeah. There you go. This is one. So the main changes were changing this chart and what they did. They changed the wording. So as you can see, there used to, there used to be three columns, but now there's only one. And it gets very consistent. Child born after one September, September one, two thousand five, and child born after you know one nine nine through two thousand five. That's all the state really did. They just clarified it. And if you get a look at the history, every year we review this document. We're going to review it again next year because it's our seventh graders' birthdays are different. Our high school, our twelfth grade, our twelfth graders' birthdays are different. So that's the only changes. And the one comment on that, and you caught it, I think, is that these get revised. They get the final revised date on the date that the second approval or the third approval, the right. final approval. And I caught that. And like I said, I will make sure you comment on the heading. It looked fine on my computer, but I will double check it and make sure the heading's good. Okay. So I make a. Isn't it true that we can't even enforce these immunization policies yes. in the state of Idaho? Yeah. Um, we can't make it mandatory. Last I heard. So why do we have a policy? But that. Right. There are exemptions of that. There are. Uh, the schools are required uh, to, when we, when a student registers, they have to uh, give their birth certificate, copy of the birth certificate, and then their immunization records need to be up to date. We have to report that to the state, and the state sends us. And then there also is an exemption form that counts in that, and if a parent chooses to exempt from immunization, they just fill out that form. Correct. And then that counts as record. And, and that's what he's put, um, Troy, at the very top. Um, if Steffi were to roll up there, you added the bright bold there. Right. Let's hear she submits exemption. That is correct. Yeah. And for someone who's in many states, okay. all states are doing it right now. And Ann actually reviewed this. Did you have a comment, Ann? Well, yeah. That's, yeah that's okay. If you scroll down, it tells you exactly what you need to do. As referenced below, it tells you exactly what you need to do to exempt. Right. And so the in the state right of Idaho, there are several different ways you can exempt. There's probably the exemptions are right here. How you do it. Yeah, I see. So, and that's why I added that at the top, because they passed last year. Um, at the state level, that when you tell them that you have to, that it's mandated to get these vaccines to start school, you have to at the same time tell them that they can get an exemption. Correct. In the state of Idaho, and so that's why it's also at the top because as soon as they say you have to, you accept that if you have this exemption, and then that's referenced for all. So yeah, some some it. states try to hide it, but we put it right there in bold. Or some school districts try high, I should say. I apologize. Not states. Okay. Should we Are there any questions on this one? Do questions? You, uh, no. Do you need a motion on this one? Yes, please. I'll make a motion to approve the first read of 3525. Trustee Hall makes a motion to approve. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, Vice Chair Brown makes a second. All those in favor of the immunization records, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Hey, that one's good. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> okay,
first, second, the first one you're taking back. First one taken yes. back. Yep. Okay. Issues. What about bring it back next month? Policy 4500P. Worry about it. It's the same time. We're going to bring all. Okay. We're going to make it a statewide thing. We're going to bring it back next month. What material? Cannot. The public gifts and donations. Yes. Okay. Sorry, Miss Lack. Okay. 4500P. That's. Did you 4500 P two was there? All the 4500 okay. Okay. Perfect. 2510 P and then when the trustee hall pointed out, we'll bring them all through the letter revision next month. But the the one for 4500 P, I mean we're we haven't opened it up to look approve it for the first read. Do I guess are you thinking you're going to bring it back and I'm we'll do it back and we'll do first read back. last time? Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you all, all about, for doing it. About five more. <laughs> Thank you. Some of them, hopefully, we, we did some of those, and hopefully, they got um, some of them. We actually went through, and I'm hoping that you're not redoing what we did. So, um, we're doing just the following. Some of the ones on the list we're not touching earlier. Yeah, it seems like one or two on the fall we actually did do, but we'll see. I'll, I'll compare. Okay. I'll compare Next. Um, Point board clerk. I'll make a motion, I guess, to bring to the table, appoint the board clerk, or I'll make a motion to appoint the board clerk. Okay. Uh, um, of Laura Hall, I guess that would be our, the person who we are appointing. Okay. Second. I'll second that. Okay. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Two opposed, two in favor? Um, uh, Vice Chair um, Brown and uh, Trustee Reinbold. Um, I can't vote, right? Yes. Okay. okay I, um, I vote to appoint uh, a board clerk. Okay. The motion carries. The board clerk is appointed. Okay. Next is a uh, firm. So, yes. yes? For, just for clarification, you um, a vote yay to for Laura Hall. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Just wanted the clarification. Okay, affirm public records coordinator. Um, uh, do I hear a motion to bring that to the floor? I'll make a motion to bring that to the floor and then just hear who it is. Yeah, I don't know anything about this. Okay, I'll second it. Okay, uh, Vice Chair Brown seconds it. Okay, and I believe it's what when we did it before, it's usually been the board clerk who's the public records coordinator. Um, I don't know if that's who is. We affirm the superintendent, if not mistaken, has the role of appointing the public records coordinator, the custodian of the records. We just sort of affirm it. Okay, so has this always been done in the past? Um, we did it during our annual meeting, okay. yes. And so this is kind of the follow-up because of the change with step, um, board, Steffi Pavey stepping down as board clerk. Then she kind of steps down from this role unless we okay. make this affir affirmation again. Okay. So I guess it's with Superintendent Branham, who is she identifying as the public records coordinator or custodian of records, then we just say we affirm it. We vote to affirm it. And okay. I don't know if you want it to be the board clerk again. I mean, or that's that's kind of what it, that's the way it was with the annual yeah. meeting. I think so. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor of affirming um, board clerk as a uh, public records coordinator, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Uh, board clerk is now a coordinator of uh, um, custodian, records. custodian records. Okay, superintendent report. Okay. Um, 
We've gotten a lot of phone calls since I've started about three policies in particular within the schools, um, bullying, dress code, and cell phone use. Um, so I have asked the junior high and high school principals to form a joint parent council um, committee for those schools and they will start meeting with that parent council to address these policies that need to be enforced. Um, that will start taking place on, I believe, Monday? Yeah. Yes, okay. And um, I think during your report, you're going to talk about that a little bit? I was, you just said what I was okay. going to say. Great. <laughs> okay, so maybe you might want to just... Yeah, Williams, that's yeah, really well. what was the first one? Um, <coughs> so it, you can just talk about it a little bit when you're doing your reports. Principals will re um, also be reporting... Well, we already did that. We, I told you they will be reporting on their individual school skip calendars or their school schedules due to pending considerations for possible cost savings. The junior high and the high school may not be fully developed. We have brought to the table in the leadership team the idea of taking the kids out of the junior high for next year. The reason being the boiler is going to fail at any minute. We don't know when it's going to happen. We know it's going to happen. And if we don't have a plan in place and the kids play somewhere else and the boiler breaks or the boiler fails in the middle of the winter, we're going to be in deep doo-doo. So we are looking at the possibility of the cost savings because that, that uh, junior high is like bleeding. Part of the reason that our per pupil expenditure is so high is because it's like having open windows. Mm -hmm. That heat runs nonstop. It, the air, it gets hotter than heck in the spring and the summer, and it is freezing cold in the winter. So it's nothing but uh, an energy, yeah, it's just, it's, it's costing too much to run that building. So we are looking about how the cost savings would be if we took in three um, portable, portables. We move the junior high kids over there. It'll be able to share staff, share principals. We'll have more resources for the kids. So we're looking at that, and we're, we're putting cost-saving calculations to that with Ken Eldor. Um, possible. Another thing that we are on the table as a proposal, I don't want the community to get all freaked out and thinking, oh my god, what are they doing? But this is on the table. And we are going to take a look at it. I had Stephen Lambert from Classical Education, um, the executive director from Edu Classical Schools, approach me. He would like to know, because his schools are funded, or the school buildings are funded by Albertsons. He called me and asked me if we might be interested in Albertsons purchasing our junior high school. That would liquidate our assets in that school and then we could look at how much we could get for it and build onto the high school for the junior high. So they would come in if they were to purchase that. Mr. Lambert is going to be coming to take a look and a tour of that school at the end of this month. Um, they, would, they would then be, if they will be surveying the community on who would be interested in the classical education and they would start their own charter school. It would be um, open to lottery only, so kids are chosen by lottery, and the classical education school, charter school, which would be called Priest River Academy of um, Classical Ed. Um, that school would start K through three, very small, because the classical education is, is pretty comprehensive, so they'd start at K through three. He said they'd hold about to begin with, about 65 kids. So that might take the burden off of pre-RE. Um, <clears throat> reason being with the small, because they assimilate the classical education K through three, and then they'd add the fourth grade the next year, the fifth grade the year after that, the sixth grade the year after that, until they got up to a full K through 12 school. So that is in the making. It is being brought to the table. We are going to be taking a look at it. Again, it would liquidate our assets in the junior high. That building would be totally re renovated by Albertsons. And I saw pictures of this school over in Fruitland that they re renovated. It's almost identical to this junior high, and it is beautiful. 
I mean, it's gorgeous. Albertsons has a lot of money. So that's in the making. Um, <clears throat> oh, last thing. I began my, my administrative and my department head evaluations, and I should have be those done by the completion of next week. That's it. Thank you. Good. Uh, next, uh, administrator reports. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Do you want to go or do you want me to go when we're doing that? Let's see. I did most of mine. We were told we're going tomorrow. Yeah, she did most of hers too. Sorry. what I gave you was a list of the current enrollment at Priest Lake Elementary as well as Idaho Hill, Idaho Hill. and um, if you would just take Idaho Hill's page first, what I wanted to show you there was what we talked about at the budget workshop. Um, you can see the students that are enrolled in each class currently and in the kinder and first I just wanted to show you um, we have four students identified with IEPs in kindergarten and then five in uh, first grade. So you can see the class sizes. To the right where it's current funding, I wanted to just demonstrate to you um, how the district has paid for uh, these, this staffing. Um, the Title I, our Title I budget does pay for one of our certified teachers. And then under after special services, um, I just put in here, I just wanted you to be aware that we have uh, 13 students in the school that have speech IEPs only, so they need special um, classes for that. We have nine students with a 504 plan, and um, those are accommodations for students that have had a diagnosis. And then we do have the music teacher um, it equates to a day and a half that services all of our kids and same same time frame for Mr. McMahon we share those teachers with the junior high and the at Priest River Elementary and Priest Lake Elementary and then you can see we have a counselor that we share currently between Idaho Hill and Priest Lake and that counselor uh, has been funded through ESSER funds which will end at the end of this year we also have a nurse that is there two days a week. She supports uh, Nurse Kelly, who's full-time in the district. And her position has also been paid with ESSER funds that will be done at the end of this year. And we do have a student who needs a catheter change two times daily at, our, at Idaho Hill. Um, and then the behavior interventionists that I spoke about earlier, they, have, they are paid through Medicaid. And then below that staff member, you'll see two special education paraprofessionals. They are currently one, each is working in our, one in kindergarten and one in first grade. And they are ESSER, one is ESSER funds, maybe two, I'm not sure. And one is ESSER funds, the other is special education. So I just wanted to bring this before you tonight because if we lose those positions for the, that are funded by ESSER funds, that's going to be a huge loss in support for our students. And then we have a paraprofessional who teaches, takes care of all of our library and technology classes. 
And then we also have literacy funds that are kinder through third grade. We get literacy funds uh, at all three elementary schools. So we have a full-time parapro uh, that services those kids and we have some Title I paraprofessionals. So that's the current staffing at Idaho Hill. And I had just mentioned to you before, just asking that next year we consider a combination first, second grade to go along with that primary end. Any questions regarding Idaho Hill? No, thank you, this is really good. And then I just wanted to try and create that clear picture for you. Then Priest Lake enrollment, currently we have 62 students up there. And you can see Sarah Butler is teaching, kinder, they have combination classrooms with the exception of fourth grade. So they have anywhere from 16 to 20 students in a class. And those funds are paid out of general. They did have an ESSER funding for a certified teacher for the last two years. And this year, uh, the team decided uh, to make fourth grade just a straight fourth grade because there were some needs that they felt like could benefit the children by just having one, one grade level. And then we have a fifth and sixth grade classroom. There are no special service teacher. There are no services for special services at Priest Lake Elementary. If a student has an IEP, their services would be at Priest River Elementary. So we do have, um, and I, I wanted you to see this too, we have a couple of students who were eligible for IEPs, but their parents uh, wanted them at Priest Lake Elementary because it's just close. They didn't want them busing and they're younger. And we are servicing one speech IEP and we have three kids on 504s. And then Mr. Boosterman and Mr. McMahon come up there and service art for PE and music. Uh, Priest Lake Elementary is very fortunate in that community has a Priest Lake Education Association. And so that group funds a preschool teacher up there for all children. So they have preschool and we currently have eight kids there. And then we have these paraprofessionals that I, I, when I wrote this, it was like, oh, I'm gonna have to explain this. So Marilee is our secretary, but she has like an hour and a half of her day where she's Title I paraprofessional, so then she goes out and teaches. And Miss Wendy is our bus driver and our lunch duty aide. And then in between all of that, she has a certain amount of time that she's teaching reading classes. And then Miss Jessica comes three days in the afternoon. And Mr. Mick is three days. So they have, they have all these little pieces of funding that then these people pop in and out and help meet the needs of the kids. And then a full-time secretary. So any questions about Priest Lake? Uh, you said that the preschool teacher is 100% paid by the association? Yes. But they do run it through the district funding. So you will see that when you're looking through district funding under Priest Lake Elementary, it says something like, I can't remember. What does it, but you will, you will notice it's a, they deposit in and then it's paid out of district funding. So it's all recorded and everything. Mm -hmm. Good. And then otherwise at both schools, we're just really busy because March is really heavy academic. I mean, it's always heavy academic, but we're in school five days a week. There's, you know, not holidays or anything. So people are just working really hard to help kids get where they need to be. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Really good Next. Uh, who's, who's next? Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, 
Hey, Amber Williams, principal of Priest River Junior High School. Um, so my report is not quite as put together as far as staffing that as um, Ms. Lucky's was. So, but if you see at the top, it does say at the junior high. <clears throat> so first we have our student enrollment. So we are currently at 97 eighth graders and 86 seventh graders. Um, and so with those students, um, we are currently running nine full-time teachers. And then I have four traveling staff. So I share staff with the high school and Idaho Hill. Um, and those four teachers I only get in my building one period. Some of them are there for two periods. Um, so I have nine full-time teachers and then I have one special education teacher. And um, that covers a minimum of 3.5 sections per grade level and that's six times a day right now because we run a six period day. So um, it's a lot of juggling sometimes and it can be difficult to make that master schedule and even out those class sizes um, because of student needs and where they have to fall in the schedule based on certain things. So we have a group of students who um, are in advanced math, eighth grade students in advanced math and for that class they go to the high school. So they go to high school for algebra. Um, this year, the high school runs a different schedule than we do. So our class times do not match. Um, but the kids go over there, they get their algebra instruction, and then they come back to us. And then they, they're with us. They've missed most of the second period of the junior high by then. So we've placed those kids in, um, it's kind of like a study hall. Um, it's just a, a small amount of time where they can go through their agendas, get their plans out for the day. This is what they need to get done, make sure they understand where their homework at the high school is at, and they can get help from um, teachers for any of the subjects that they are in, um, with the exception of algebra. And so those students are doing that. But we also have students that are higher needs, and so we do offer that um, intervention math class, and we're only offering that this year in seventh grade. And the reason that we are only offering it in seventh grade is because we started out offering it in both grades. Um, and we just, our, our class sizes were too heavy because our, our seventh grade math teacher teaches um, regular seventh grade, or I'm sorry, our eighth grade teacher teaches regular pre-algebra, eighth grade pre-algebra, but she can only teach three sections of that. And then we have a seventh grade pre-algebra. So it's the same class, but we've mixed those classes, the grade levels last year, we tried to mix them. It just doesn't work very well. So we separated those seventh graders out again this year, running those two separate sections. Um, and then if you put in a math intervention class, that leaves us with three sections of pre-algebra for 90, well, probably actually more like 80 um, eighth graders. And that just didn't work very well. Um, we also have some kids that need extra support in their behaviors. And so when you start combining some of those kids together and there's not a lot of flexibility of moving them back and forth in classrooms, it can get very um, difficult to teach a larger class at the junior high level. So we had to eliminate that eighth grade intervention, um, math intervention. So we're only offering that seventh grade. I think that it is working very nicely. We're seeing some growth. We're seeing kids um, go in and get that extra help in the seventh grade levels. And then our eighth grade teacher also runs um, during her math, or sorry, during her lunch period, she's open to have students come in and get some math help during that time as well and before school. So that's working out well um, for the kids that really kind of need that extra help but aren't getting it throughout the day. We have one counselor, uh, Miss Top, and she is absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, a necessity at our school. She, I cannot do my job without her, and I don't think the teachers can do their jobs without her. Um, our kids, and I know it was touched on earlier, but we have some s kids in this, in our schools, that are going through different things. On top of the fact, um, just being in junior high itself, 
is a rough time in your life. Think about back when you were in junior high. That is a rough time. Nobody wants to be in junior high. <laughs> so we're getting these kids through the junior high level, but now we're doing it also with some extra things on their plates. We've got some trauma that we're handling and we're learning as educators, we're learning about trauma. It's not something that is really taught well yet for us. And so we're learning those things. And Miss Top is absolutely a key player in that. She is able to handle those kids so amazing and they trust her and they go to her and they disclose things to her that she can help them with. Um, and then if they're disclosing, obviously there are things that if, if they're disclosed, we share that out with parents as well. Um, there are certain rules of engagement when it comes to school counselors, but sometimes kids just need to vent and, and they don't feel comfortable coming into my office all the time because they associate me with trouble. And so they don't wanna come in and spill their deepest thoughts to me, um, but they feel comfortable doing that with Miss Top. And I, I, if we were to, lose counselors at all in our schools, I think we're gonna be in really, really big trouble. Um, and keep in mind that right now, Ms. Top is also a shared staff, so she's only at the junior high um, Tuesday through Friday, which seems like a lot, but that Monday, it's a rough day. Um, it's a really rough day, especially if we're coming off of a long weekend. Um, and then we have our math instructional coaches, and they are another key piece, I feel, in what we're being successful in. And our math instructional coaches come in and they work with our core teachers. And again, it's all about that relationship building and being in the classroom and giving those ideas and um, working with the teachers in an environment where the teachers might need some support. And I'm happy to give that to them. But when they do it with an instructional coach, they don't feel like they're being judged by by their administrator, and that can be really tough for some, some teachers sometimes to have the administrator always the one in there telling them, well, you could do this or you could try that. And my staff is amazing and we get along really well and they're very comfortable with me, but those instructional coaches are amazing at what they do. Um, and then I did wanna share at the end of the first semester, we had 43% of our students make honor roll which means that they had a GPA of 3.0 or higher. Um, and that's a pretty significant increase from what we saw last year. And I think all these people working together is just helping us start to blossom and bloom um, to the best of our students' abilities and, and doing what's best for kids. Um, and then on your reports, I have some, just some data. Those, that's off of an RC, or yeah, off of our RCBM. Um, which is not a standardized test, but it's like a progress monitoring test, just seeing where the kids were when they came in and where have we got, where are we now that we're, these were done in the winter and the fall, so, um, or fall and the winter. So where did we go from that, those two places? In my opinion, the winter to fall is not always the best gauge of growth because they are learning so much and going so quickly um, and we put a lot on them. And then these tests come sort of in that crazy holiday break time and it can be difficult to get kids to really buy into it. So I'm very excited. We have ISATs that are gonna start happening um, in the next month. And I'm very excited to see where we're at in those scores. I think we're gonna be, I think we're gonna really show some good improvement. So I'm very excited. Um, and that's kind of what's happening at the junior high. Oh, Mr. George and my little note just said exactly what Superintendent Brandon said. Uh, Mr. George and I have put together a group of junior high and senior high school uh, parents to help us brainstorm ideas and thoughts on addressing concerns in our schools, specifically for bullying, cell phone usage, and dress code. Does the school board have any questions for the junior high? Mm -hmm. No. Thank I don't. you. I don't. Do you? Thank you. All right. Good. I didn't get your hand out, sorry. This is the longest one you'll ever have for me, by the way. So. Matt George, principal of the Priest River Lamont High School. Um, this is the longest board report I will probably hopefully ever give. My apologies, it's the, like for the whole agenda. But um, uh, first off, um, just to piggyback off what Amber said about the eighth graders, our eighth graders coming up to the high school with the block schedule alternating A, B days. Um, I think they're orange days, I believe. For first period, I believe they're in algebra. And then fifth period, the alternating first period on the black days. 
they're taking online IDLA classes. So uh, the first semester they earned the algebra credit for first semester algebra. They also earned their high school health credit. Second semester they're earning their second semester algebra credit and now they're working on their ninth grade technology except for one student who is working on a programming which will still fulfill that requirement for the technology um, piece from them as well. So they're going to they're gonna finish eighth grade with knock on wood four credits of uh, high school. So just to piggyback on that, that's a win-win for us. Um, okay, to get this going, um, since I thought we are going to be at the beginning, Academic at a stage, just one more time, that's awesome. Uh, thank you all for your support and the applause for that, that minute a ton to our kids. Uh, they're great kids, they work hard, and their goal is to make it to nationals. Um, and hopefully they get to come back and ask for support to get to travel to nationals at some point. <clears throat> okay, the nuts and bolts. My high school bell schedule. I've spent about three months trying to come up with a perfect schedule. Uh, ever since the conversation on the four-day week started, I realized right away that the block AB was going to be very difficult. Biggest obstacle was state um, law requiring 60 instructional hours for credit in high school. Um, that wasn't going to work. So we, uh, our staff and I worked and worked and worked on different options. We finally um, uh, settled on a seven period day, 60 minutes each. Um, school, school would start at 7.45 and end at 3.45. Um, which is not really a horrible change, it's just basically tacking an hour on to the day. However, there's a caveat to that. Two things happened. Um, I would not accept a bell schedule that reduced instructional time per class per week. So currently with the alternating A, B block schedule, um, for example, you'll meet Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then the next week you'll meet Tuesday, Thursday, let's say it's a uh, first period. Problem with that is you're meeting 225 minutes on average per week. You have 90 minute classes times five, that's 450. Divide that in half to get your average per week, that's 225 instructional minutes, let's say in first period per week. Um, by adding 60 minutes to the school day and going to a seven period day at 60 minutes, I was actually able to increase instructional time from 225 minutes per week to 240 instructional minutes per week per class. So we're actually increasing instructional time per class by adding 60 minutes to the day and going to a four day week. Um, so there's a huge caveat there. Um, I mean, it's 15 extra minutes, but that's over four days at 15 extra minutes. Just to say it's, a, it's four minutes or just, just shy of four minutes. That's finishing a question, a student asking class, class that might've been an important question for the day. Um, so that's pretty huge there. Um, what the seventh period would look like, um, one of the things that, one of the first ideas we came up with, um, right now we offer eight periods. The reason we went to the eight period block was because the six periods traditional schedule handcuffed us with uh, electives we offered our kids. Um, and by going to the block schedule, that allowed us to offer more electives for our kids. So seven periods allows us to continue to offer the same electives because teachers would still teach six periods. And so we don't have to cut any electives, we don't have to cut any programs because of a bell schedule. Um, however, seventh period at the end of the day, in which you guys approved already earlier in the fall with giving a PE credit for athletics, our plan next year is to start athletic practices at normal time, 245. So the students will be enrolled in an athletic class, will be coded as, an, an act, as a PE athletics class. So they start their athletics, and if they finish that sports season, they get that PE credit. Now there's some, my, some little nuances to be worked out because semesters don't match with basketball season and football season, but we, we can work that out. If you, if you play like football or volleyball, for example, um, you may have to, you may just go into a weights, a weights class during that time and then until basketball started, or if you didn't play basketball, um, we'll, we'll work those out. But uh, that's kind of a hat, tip of the hat to the community so that the students aren't uh, picking up their siblings super late if they need to and getting home driving late, um, especially in the wintertime and basketball season where we have to go early late practices instead of four and six and then six and eight, we could stick with our three and five, five and seven. And that hour makes a difference there. Um, that seventh period would also be allows us to do a more response intervention. So it gives us time. We can actually, instead of having our students enrolled in an RTI class for 90 minutes every single, every other day, or being enrolled in an RTI class every day, we can actually run our RTI as a true RTI program because true RTI is you pull them out, you help them, get them back. Pull them out, help them, get them back. So at the high school, we'll actually be able to do true RTI 
which is I think is a huge win-win. So let's say you're an athlete and you're playing volleyball. Well, you need extra help with math. We're going to pull you out, give you those interventions, 25, 30 minutes, whatever that needs, get you back out. Or if you have to come out of a fun elective class, which is my next point um, with the seventh period, that, that'll be more of the non-academic type electives. Um, the fun electives, the things that make school fun to go to every day. Um, and then we can pull those kids out, put them back in um, that way as well. So that's the plan next year um, at the high school. Um, graduation correct credits, uh, nailing those down, but it'd be very minor. Um, right now, we, they have 16 electives required for graduation and 56 credits out of the 64 possible. It looks like 53 credits required for graduation. They, most of those can just come out of required electives that way uh, because students would be able to earn 50, would be able to earn 56 total. So we'll nail that down and that'll be part of my um, uh, student handbook come May and June. Um, attendance and enrollment, every high school, almost every high school in region one lost 10% of its student body at that at semester. Um, that was from the region one principals meeting. Uh, that's been a trend the last few years. Most schools, including pretty sure Lamana High School, cite anxiety, inability to cope um, with uh, things. And then the, the term used is bullying, but um, all the principals agreed that that pretty much was, I can't deal with someone having a different opinion than me. So that's, uh, that, I just thought that was important to cite that 10% of the student body in North Idaho in high schools left to go do something else which is when we're right on par with that. We were at 315-ish at semester, or right before the end of the semester, and we're at 286-ish now, so that's about 10%. Staffing, um, this is why it's long, because we were asked to present certain things, so my apologies, but that's okay. 34 positions at Free Sherville Lamont High School, not including maintenance and food service. 20 full-time teachers, which is actually 22, because we have one on military leave, and she's coming back, right, next year? Okay. Um, and um, who's our life skills teacher. And then we had one English position that never got filled. But right now we're operating with 20 full-time, two shared with the junior high, um, four and a half para pros, three work in special education services, one is a behavioral interventionist, ISS, um, and another one is doing half-time IDLA classes. Three secretaries, one counselor, one near peer gear up coordinator, one behavior spe one behavioral specialist, um, and uh, one athletic director slash dean of students. So that that's the 34 positions at the high school. Um, Mrs. Williams and I are working on the, what it could look like at the high school, the feasibility of combining the two buildings. Ms. Brandon just talked about that. There's actually some exciting possibilities with that. Ms. Williams and I are, again don't know what those look like yet but we'll, we'll work on that and figure out what that could be. Hearing her, hearing her talk about Ms. Top, not knowing that she wasn't there every day, that to me could be a huge win, having two counselors in one building, that could be huge. So um, just, just hearing you talk, just thought about that. So we'll talk more about that later. But, yeah. um, sharing resources was, uh, is, is another opportunity there as well. I believe you had four K-8 certified? Yes. Um, and then the other staff were 6 through 12 certified, which means that that's an easy sharing of, of resources there. Um, district funding and levy funds account for $71,790 at the high school. State career technical education funds uh, amount to $50,812. Uh, there are opportunities for more of those if we, um, with some of the courses we already offer like forestry, um, if we call it, right now we have to offer botany, we have to code it as botany because our uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Hughes, if he, did, if he did a few other things over here, we could call it forestry, and it could still be a science class, but yet be funded through CTE. Now, not his teaching position, but there would be resources funded through that. Um, that's one example. There's a couple others in science. Um, some schools like Clark Fork, they can get a lot of their general ed credits through CTE and the state funds significantly. And I thought it'd be interesting to share a $50,000, well, almost $51,000 goes into the high school from CTE funds from the state, not our local. That's state CTE dollars. Um, Perkins grant, federal, correct, Ms. Trawl? Perkins grant, um, $33,820 is our current funding for that. That is only for welding. 
um, this year. But again, other programs, if they change, like we have a couple other programs that are CTE that are still working on an old cluster program system. If they change to strands and made a few adjustments, they would get, they could be, they qualify for Perkins as well. So that's some, that's some uh, other opportunities for funding that we'll be looking into that um, Mr. Hall and I will talk more about as well. Um, I wanted to point out that there was an article in the paper about the high school uh, uh, being identified as a school needing improvement. It has nothing to do with accreditation. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Um, this is not a North Idaho College situation. This is basically the state saying, hey, you guys struggle with them some things. You have three years of help and support to get it done. Um, and so that's where we're going. Every, uh, our capacity builder who works with me and, Ms. and Dr. Branham um, ha has made it very clear that everything we're doing at the high school that we started last spring uh, puts us in a great position. Uh, unfortunately, just what we started last spring was too late because ISAT's already done and things like that. So um, it is support for the high school and the district for three years. Um, the nice thing is the state fully recognizes that when a high school is uh, recognized as a needing improvement, it's not just the high school. Um, so they recognize that as well. Um, everything we are doing for the state fits perfectly with the five-year strategic plan as well. We won't do anything that gets sideways with that. And uh, the five-year plan fits perfectly with what the state would like to see. So consequences are basically you stay in improvement if you don't improve. That's basically the consequences. So um, almost done, sorry. Sports and activities, spring sports are underway. Just waiting for the snow to clear. Um, I know it's not spring yet, it feels like it, but waiting for the snow to clear. Other news, staff is working on how to face challenges that get in the way of us achieving excellence. Um, how to make school more enjoyable so students work harder. Staff's really excited about this, uh, um, the extra hour added to the day and that seventh period being a time to uh, enjoy time with kids, get things done, RTI and things like that. Um, how to create a positive environment that encourages risks and resiliency positive risks and resiliency, and uh, refining and creating that Spartan Way culture. Uh, we'll get that parent, we have that parent advisory council for the junior high ready to go. We'll meet Monday. And ISATs, we have determined we will test grades 10 and 11. The test has moved to 11th grade, not a sophomore test anymore. Sophomores who score proficient or better get to bank that test and do not have to take it their junior year. We decided not to test freshmen because it is a junior test. And uh, that, if we were a high performing school, if we were at the 80, 90% proficiency, we agreed that testing the freshmen would be a good idea. Um, the data would be nice, but we also don't want to put our students in a situation where they don't have a clue what's on that test yet. And so we want to give it a couple years and, and hopefully get our numbers up. So. Okay. Perfect. Sorry that was so long. Yeah. Would you be able to share your notes? You ran off a lot of numbers, and I need to figure out which principal or administrator that's yours. Which I can make copies. That, that specials program, and if you can do a similar for your what you're proposing for your schedule. Similar for what? I'm sorry. For these. What, I don't to, know what that is. I'm it's, sorry. It's a breakdown of the schedule for the day. Just 60 minutes for seven periods. So it would be start nice at two forty, start at seven forty five and it would be nice to have it in writing if oh, possible. Okay. I can I can share the actual schedule with you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. It's yeah. just to rattle off these numbers and take notes and then have to go back to review okay. them. It would be very nice to have a report in writing. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, are are you currently doing like, you know, the um, work credit for the students? Or if they're going out and they're, you know, working say at Mitchell's or not not yet because you just approved that this fall. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I, and I thought you approved it for next year only, so I, I didn't start that yet. Okay. But it's met with lots of people about that. Uh, Lewis and Clark State College, there's a group looking, working with uh, Aeroset and uh, Newport High School and us trying to put together a workforce center in the region. Um, I, don't, I didn't feel like I had enough information to share with the board. Didn't want to get hopes up, but that is, uh, that is something we're looking at. And uh, yes, we'll be looking at elective credits and I believe it's averages 10 hours per week as I believe it's the student averages 10 hours a week of work they can receive an elective credit. Okay, yeah, because yeah. I know there's a lot of independent contractors that have been looking and saying, can we get kids to be apprentices, you know, get them started and then if they yes. work full time during the summer, 
now they've got a trade, so as soon as they get out of high school, they've got something that they're marketable with. And that policy you guys approved this fall opens up the gateways for that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we were, you know, following up with that. Yes, ma'am. Mr. George, one of the biggest things about that is the 18 rule on insurance, and that's been a big problem for a lot of the local, especially the wood industry, the lumber industry, mm -hmm. because their insurance will not cover if they're under 18. And they're working on that, and I know the state has been working on that for the career technical education. The other piece is you used to have, three years ago, you had to have a person in the school qualified to do that. And that was their only job. Two years ago, they changed it to any career technical education teacher can oversee that as long as it's within their profession. So, And the... And the uh, the group that's looking at, um, it's an organization out of Washington um, that's working on that. They would actually provide all that oversight, all the insurance and everything for 16 and up. Okay. So it changed, and, and they're a, working. It's a positive with, way to go. It's, yeah, it, things, things have shaken up a lot since uh, um, what Mr. Hall pointed out with a couple of years back where you had to be 18 and then all the insurance was still on, on either, either it had to be on the district responsibly or it had to be on the workplace. Um, and now there's some there's some wiggle in the state as to uh, how how they they code that or whatever they do at the state level for for who's responsible on the insurance part. And it takes a lot of it off the school district now. Okay. And there's independent agencies out there that can provide that for the workplace. Okay. Yeah, that's some exciting stuff. I just need more time to meet with them. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make some copies. That's very good. Thank you. Um, before we move on, I, I forgot, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say one thing about that classical education school that might, the charter school. That really might be also a benefit because I had Billy do some research for me. Ex-mayor, hello. Um, we have 330 some homes being built, some presently on the now and the rest on the docks. So we're looking at an influx of population that we need. So that would be a win-win situation if, if that occurs. Oh, pretty. Thank you. I'm Kim Shainer, I'm the Special Ed Director. Um, so I just put together a little packet of um, our total enrollment by school. As you can see on the front page, I broke it down into a pie chart just by our students at each school. Um, obviously, Priest River Elementary, and these are students with special education services, has 80 students. Um, the junior high right now has 11. And I want to put a caveat in there. Last year she had 27. So this, these numbers can change. Um, Idaho Hill has 28 students who are re receiving special education services. The high school has 34. We have one student receiving speech services at the lake. Um, so when I, then I broke it down by school and what support staff, this is the second one, and uh, Vice Chair Brown, you got everything but the first page in the email. Yes. So um, this is similar. But you can see, I broke it down into speech, which, which classes we have. Um, I know you're gonna look at some of our smaller classes. We have two life skills classes at the, elementary school that only have six students. On the very back is a weighted caseload chart that will tell you how we make those decisions. There's no state standards on how many students. We have to make them on, based on the student need and what's best for those students. So these very back two pages can kind of talk about where we would need more support. Um, and then you kind of have an overview of each school. Couple of things, um, some good news. We just had a personal care nurse today accept the position for one of our highly impacted students. 
I am so excited. This has been, um, since COVID, we haven't had somebody come in with this student. And so we've had to cover other ways. Um, that being said, I want the board to really, I mean, I'm hoping we need to think about how to retain these people. You know, how are we going to keep all of these people working with these students? Because it's not easy work. And I know Trustee uh, Rutledge came in and viewed our special education <coughs> program, but we have, it, it's, it's hard. And we have a, some significantly impacted students with some pretty significant behavior needs. With these numbers, I also want to tell you we have at least 10 new referrals that have come in that we are evaluating. So all of these numbers could change. That's a lot of students when they come to special education services, especially in some of the smaller schools. So our highest increase is at Idaho Hill. Um, and we have, a, you know, that kindergarten class is pretty rough. So if you guys have any questions for me. I don't know. Yeah. Well, when we talked before about when students are given this um, special ed status somewhere else and then they come to us, mm -hmm. and we talked about do we reevaluate them to make sure that they're... We do not. We have to, by state or by federal law, we have to have a continuum of services. So that means if they come with a service, we have to do our best to provide that service or have something similar to that service. That being said, there are cases where we may have to reevaluate depending on that student's eligibility and de depending on how they progress. There have been cases, and I, I, in certain cases, where we're kind of questioning if the student actually qualifies. We can reevaluate at any time if there is a, a need. Um, evaluations take a long time, they take a long time. <laughs> So it's not something we just want to say, hey, Johnny, let's see where you're at today. We, you know, we have to write sometimes 20 page reports on that whole process and what we're seeing. We have to have several <coughs> professionals come in and do different evaluations. So that being said, we don't do it on every student, but there are quite a few that come in that we have had to do a reevaluation on. <coughs> Bless you. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, no more administrators. Treasurer's report. No. Uh, thank you. Thank you. No other questions. No questions. Uh, Uh, next, comments from the audience. Uh, and I have Hannah Hurst. Hey again. I just have a couple of questions that I feel haven't been answered to date. And the, these are in regards to the four-day week, and I know that you guys are not reconsidering the decision, but I still have some questions that I feel would be beneficial to answer for the community and the parents involved in the situation. Um, on January 20th, I had emailed Trustee Brown with questions as to what information she had used to determine her vote in favor of the 40 week, and she said she'd get that to me, and I haven't seen it yet, so I'm still hoping that that will be provided. Um, and then on the 9th of this month, I sent an email to Chairman Rutledge with three specific questions, and I haven't heard anything back yet from you, so hopefully I'll be getting a response with those answers. If not, I'm going to go ahead and read my questions to the full board right now, and in the hopes that maybe the four of you that did vote in favor can answer the questions. Um, one, where specifically are we going to see the cost savings for the district? We keep hearing about the percentage, but we haven't really seen where that's coming from. Two, what data did you use that shows how this change would have a positive academic effect on our district? And this is important, uh, well obviously it's important, but it's especially since our high school is under the three year review right now, it'd be nice to see what information you used that would show how this would positively affect the academics of our students. And the third question is when looking at the teacher retention, as I know that was one of the big points for this decision, were salaries taken into consideration and if you did speak to other districts who are using a four-day week with teacher retention, did you look at their, their wages in comparison with ours? And if they're paying higher wages to their teachers, how did you know if it was the wage that kept the teacher there versus the 
four day week because if, if our wages aren't apples to apples, it'd be nice to know how you came up with that decision. Um, so again, I feel it's in the best interest if you guys would answer these questions. I know I'm not the only parent or community members that's wondering these same issues. And by openly sharing that information, we're going to have a greater understanding of how you made that choice. So that's what I'm asking for. I really would appreciate a response. Okay. Thank you. And did I miss any other people want to talk? <clears throat> okay, next is board reflection. Um, board reflection is, is <clears throat> our, time, our time to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to speak to um, uh, Hannah's um, co questions. Um, and anyone else can feel free to chime in at, at any time. Uh, where are the cost savings? <clears throat> the cost savings come not just one line item. It's not just you know, go to a four-day week and you're going to automatically have cost savings. Turnover costs a lot. It's huge. Um, I deal with it in my work. And we went to a four-day week specifically because of this, because of turnovers. And it's, it is a, it's a benefit that doesn't cost the district any money. Um, um, that's what, in my personal work life, we went to a four-day week, and it was a benefit because people like to hunt and fish. They like three-day weeks. Didn't cost us a thing. But then we had a higher retention, and people wanted that. Um, in fact, I had a teacher, I did a talk at um, Sandpoint High School yesterday and talked to a, a um, substitute teacher who's an English teacher, high school English teacher, by the way. Um, um, and I told her that we were going to a four-day week and she wanted to know who she could talk to. Okay, so purely anecdotal. Uh, to answer your question directly, where does the cost savings come? It comes in lots of areas, but um, but mostly teacher retention. Okay, what data did we use to um, whether or not it was academic? The academic portion of this is not what we were looking for with the four-day week. The four-day week, we were looking to implement a five-year strategic plan, quantum learning, those kind of things to then uh, align the school district. So, specifically to answer your question, there probably isn't a one-to-one -one relationship with uh, a four-day week. The data that I looked at, it had no adverse effects, but it did not change the um, um, test scores. It was, a, it was a net zero gain or loss. Okay, teacher retention. Um, yes, we looked at pay, but again, back to my first point, um, in my own personal life and uh, my own working career, we um, it was a, again a benefit that didn't cost my company any money, didn't cost the district any money because now, like I said, purely anecdotal. I talked to a teacher; she's excited to come look at at possibility of working for preserving. She lives in Sandpoint, so. To answer your three questions, that's that's from my standpoint. Any of the board feel free to speak to that? Well, and I just want to add to number two, and I did put out a statement, but um, the big benefit that doesn't cost us anything again, but actually will make us, um, uh, it will keep our kids in school, is the chronic absenteeism actually went down drastically because there's four days and so they have another day to rest, they have another day to recoup, um, and so that was huge. I think I talked to over 100 people and like 50 of them, 50% 50 of them were. That was the big selling point for that one. Yeah, I have to agree. I mean, mm -hmm. the number of people that I talked to, and teachers really liked it. It gave them more options, mm -hmm. and they were stating how, as, you know, anything happens in life when you've got to make a change it's a little rough at first because you're trying to take those baby steps um, but they said that within a few months they could see a huge difference with the staff and with the students because they were there more than they weren't you know because of the old way of like say so staff and students yeah and then number three um the teacher retention salaries i agree with what keith said but i also wanted to add in there that 
our district is not a very wealthy district. And so we want retention and we want it to matter. And so bringing in this great benefit that doesn't cost us anything, um, I mean, I've, I talked to a lot of teachers in my career and there's a lot of really great teachers now that are wanting to move to our district and I think we're gonna have a influx of applications to fill those gaps that we've got. We have to agree. Because we can't, I mean, right now we can't compete with salaries, but we can compete with schedule. There's other perks that can go along with it, yeah. Exactly. And we want good teachers so we can start um, increasing our academics. Any other comments? Not on that, but I really do like the idea of the junior high being sold. Um, I think for most people in the community, I think you would agree that spending over $100,000 a year in utilities for that one building is just crazy. And it looks like a jail. I, mean, I wouldn't want to go there. Um, but I think if we sell that, we're going to have a much better, like, you know, when you had mentioned bringing those resources together, and I think it's going to strengthen the junior high and the high school teams so much more. Is there an option with that that we can um, maybe make some sort of a, a agreement where we can still use the fields though and the gym because we are limited on gym and field time yes. for our academics or, or not sorry our sports. That's, that's just, a good idea. Um, just to be aware we have policy 9100 and if it's over a thousand dollars or greater there is a whole process it has to be appraised there has to be a whole process when you dispose mm -hmm. of the property. So it's not I mean, I think, and it's if we have it go into a contract that exceeds 10 years, or is not to exceed 10 years, and there's not less than 7% interest that we'd be charging. So we've got a policy that we need to follow. Right. And I also think, I this is one of those things that I think it's, I know that we've been looking at the um, junior high and trying to figure out ways to deal with it, but I know a few years ago that, I mean, it it's the high school, it's Priest River's original, it has historic interest. And I think it's a, in my mind, it's a community building to start with. And I'd like to hear the community input about, you know, I, some ways if it, we sold it and made it an academy, it is actually in my mind almost a competition to our public school district. And so I'd be really, I want feedback from the community on making such a decision. And we need to follow policy 9100. And it's a whole step, it's a seal bid, or you know, there's a whole process in oh, here that's yeah. Yeah, identified. That. Yeah. So, I mean, I think by letting, I mean, it was a couple of years ago, the, I mean, uh, several years ago now, and it was before new people came in, but um, there was an interest that building, people, you know, and they may want to tear it down now, but I. Oh, they can't. It's they can't. It's, well, they it's also to. flushed through with rebar, it's a huge, it's, but it's the bomb shelter during World War II. But I would like to, you know, we haven't brainstormed about other ideas using that for other ideas. So I think that, um, I think I understand, and I know Superintendent Branham said it, it's a starting point. I think it's a starting point for a conversation. Yeah, yeah. But I think we need to think carefully how we go about and get community input on it. Sure. Yeah. That's and we also ought to consider that this school district's never going to be able to afford to fix that building. No, and I know we that. We can't. And I, I realize that, but there may be somebody who wants to use it, you know, in the, you know, it's too bad that Albertsons doesn't want to come in and, you know, do something to help benefit our public school and maybe be the one that actually helps us, the public school system, renovate that building. And that's, I see it as, a, in some ways, a competitive competition to us as a public school You're afraid district. Of competition? <laughs> no, I'm not afraid of I'm not afraid of competition, but it's also it's a I'm not afraid of competition, but it's right in the center of the community. It's right smack in the center of the community. It's an icon for the community. Um, it's right on the main road. I think we're sending I just want us to think carefully about it if we go down that road because it has been part of this community for a long sure. time. And I think we need to think about it that way, and we need to make sure we get community input I, on that decision. I wouldn't look at it as competition, but more more in line of catalyst. Mm -hmm. Well, it's too bad it's not our charter school under our public school district. 
And it, is. It, is. It, is. it is. It would be. That's what it they were proposing. Be. But they're not going off separately? No. 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 It they would, would be, be under the uh, yeah. umbrella of us. That we would have to go through that whole state charter system then. Yeah. Because they, yeah. Let it be done. No. But, it, <laughs> but then it needs, you know, we need to follow, you know, that whole oh, process. Absolutely. No one's circumventing the process. Yeah. All right. Any other comments? All right. Um, next, we're going into executive session, and I need the trustees and uh, 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 Ms. Branham. I'd like you to wait till after executive session and then bring them back into us. Um, I'd like also an envelope sealed with our names on it. No, it's just. Oh, yeah. I,